Stocks are collapsing all over the place, folks. We got a lot to get into in this one here today. Some opportunities in the market, I see. Um, a lot of important stuff going on. And uh, yeah, we got stocks collapsing all over the place. This is a, a messy situation. I just want to get straight into this. Thank you, everybody. Sus subscribe to the channel. I appreciate y'all. And uh, right off the bat here, okay. First Republic Bank down over 40% here today. Over 40%. Now, when you see a move like this in something like First Republic, which has been a drama show really since SVB went under, right? I mean, when you see a move like this, it's going to cause massive instability in the market and with a whole host of a, of, of a ton of other stocks out there in the market as well. And check out the amount of shares traded here today, right? This is just pure panic capitulation, whatever you want to call it. Over 100 million shares have traded. And as of prep in this slide, I mean, we're only about halfway through the trading day. So I wouldn't be surprised if this stock trades... 200 million shares here today or something like that okay which is absolutely insane for a stock like this and this is a stock that's been halted several times during the trading day already just an absolutely incredible move for first republic after their earnings came out and this was a stock that after their initial earnings came out after hours yesterday the stock was only down like eight to twelve percent roughly it was actually holding decent and that was after Yesterday, the stock was up over 10%. So it was holding decent, but the bottom has just completely dropped off on this one here today. Now, on a three month basis, the stock is down over 93 flip and flapjack and percent. Yes, 93%. I mean, the, the thought process is that this baby's going under, okay? I don't really have an opinion on a First Republic's going under or something like that. Um, I would call it a, a coin flip at this point in time, okay? It's a 50-50, but the stock market is basically trying to tell us, like, this baby's going under. When you're talking about stocks that are down 90% plus, that's uh, the going under club. Let's call it the, the next Beth, Bed Bath & Beyonds, right? And when you see a move like this, it's going to affect way more than just one one uh, financial institution. It goes way beyond that, right? And we can see all these other players that are seen as somewhat similar to a First Republic get hit very hard today. Western Alliance Bank Corp down over 6% here today. PacWest down over 7%. Charles Schwab, which is interesting that Charles Schwab's somehow gotten lumped in with all these other banking plays. It's it's interesting. I just say it like that, okay? This one down about 4% here today. Credit Suisse, oh gosh. Okay, Signature Bank, why is it even still stock at this point in time? U.S. Bank Corp down almost 4%. That's a big dog there. You know, surprised to see that one even making that big of a move down. Key Corp down almost 6%. Zion uh, Bank Corp down uh, over 5% here today, okay? Now, when you see all this instability, you might think this is all bad news, bad news, bad news, okay? No, it's actually two really good pieces of news that happen when you have something like this happens. Actually, it's three pieces, to be honest, okay? The first one is this. This matters in a significant way. If you're going to talk about instability in the financial system, in all this concerns out, out of nowhere, right, and, and First Republic being down 40% here today, it's likely going to cause commodities to go down as well, right? And as with all things in life, there's good and there's bad that comes with everything in life, right? There really is. There's good and there's bad that comes with everything in life, right? You just got to accept it for what it is. And if you're talking about all this instability in the financial system, you're going to have commodities get hit. UCO today is down 5% roughly. I mean, that's great news. You know, if you're somebody that uh, doesn't drive uh, an electric vehicle yet, guess what? You know, you want to see oil prices go as low as possible because that's going to mean cheaper prices for you at the pump, right? And that means the Fed can uh, hopefully stop working against the market at some point in time here, right? Look at this. This is a commodities I care about list here, okay? And what we're going to find is it's Red Dead Redemption out there. UCO down 5% here today. Copper down 2.2%. WTI down over 2%. This is a commodity index in general, GSG. This is, like, if you don't want to, uh, like, track a bunch of individual commodities on a watch list, you can just add GSG to your watch list on whatever service you use, and uh, that will kind of just let you know how commodities are trading in general uh, during a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever you're keeping track of, okay? Coffee down here today, soybeans down, natural gas down, uh, silver down, wheat down, corn down, oats down. It's down across the board out there for commodities, and so this is I would say good news in regards to this, right? So you got stocks tanking all over the place, but you got something like this happening, right? Now, Whirlpool, this stock even got sent down. Now, Whirlpool is a stock I'm actually interested in likely adding shares of and buying the stock for the first time in like, oh my gosh, so many years. It's not even funny. I don't even remember the last time I owned Whirlpool, but it was quite some time ago. But this stock actually has my attention. Not because the numbers are good. The numbers are awful right now. And we're going to, I'll go through the numbers later on at the end of this video. I'll take you through their financial statements they just released yesterday. And uh, it's awful. Okay. But 
Nonetheless, I'll talk later in this video why I'm actually interested in buying the stock, but this one was interesting because it's down 5% here today, and this was actually up decently nice after hours yesterday. It was up a 4% or so after hours, and yet it just kind of tanked here today on likely. If you're going to have, here's the thing to remember, okay? If you're going to talk about bank stocks getting hit like that, right? Well, what do the banks actually do? I mean, a huge component of what they do is lending. If you're talking about potential systemic problems in the banking system, and you're talking about more potential banks going under, okay, then that's a scenario in which there's going to be more and more recession fears, right? Because the, the thought process is, oh my gosh, if these more banks go under, then they're not going to lend money. It's going to cause more banks to tighten, right? And not lend as much money out there. The more banks tighten, the more it can hurt the economy, the more recession becomes likely, okay? And so that's an important thing to remember in regards to a whole situation like this. And if you're talking about more and more recessionary scenario, thought process, obviously it hurts a company like a Whirlpool, okay? Look at who finally woke up. Oh my gosh, Mr. Vixie. He says, I'm ready to potty, baby. Let's go out and potty, okay? This baby's up about 12% here today. As you know, Vix just measures volatility in the market. And, you know, if you're going to tell me First Republic's down 40% today, yeah, Vix is going to be spiking in a massive, massive way. Like, that's the bottom line because it's going to affect way beyond just FRC in that situation, right? And to be honest, this is a one year Vix. This baby's been going dormant. It's been going to sleep over the past year, right? I mean, it's just been going down and down and down, less and less volatility in the market. The last real peak of volatility we had was in October. And then once the market bottomed around, it was October 12th, 13th or so, right? Right when the market bottomed, that's when obviously VIX just started going down and down and down. We had a little, you know, move up in VIX here and then straight back down again. This was right around when all those banks were, you know, going under SVB and a few others, right? And you had that first kind of wave there. So nonetheless, VIX is kind of in a, uh, a trend of just moving down and down and down. And we'll see if this one can even get back to this high. And I'm not so convinced of that, but we'll see. It's a possibility, but it's got a long way to go, right? If I look at some of the stocks that are moving down here big today for me, it's definitely some of the riskier plays. It just depends, right? Fubo, definitely seen as a riskier play, right? Uh, that's probably one of the riskiest, if not riskiest play I, I have any money in as far as a stock. Down big here today. Nordstrom, that one's down because if you're talking about banking system instability, you're talking about recession fears, right? Then something like a JWN gets hit down about 6% here today. Tapestry, same exact situation, 4.2% on, on recession fears. Scour Solutions, huge semiconductor play, right? If we're talking about more recessionary fears, that's going to hurt semiconductor companies. Revolve, seen as more of a growth company. By the way, that one's a tremendous long-term buying opportunity there. Great balance sheet, great income statement, great management team, great business model. I like that one a lot. Palantir down uh, under eight bucks here today. Interesting, interesting with Palantir, 3.6%. Honest down here today, right? A lot of the riskier plays. And then I was looking at some of the green stuff I have, right? Not surprising. SDAO is very green here today. So my calls on SDAO are hopefully printing some money today. Uh, SH, I have a small uh, position in SH, which is just basically an inverse of the S&P 500. Obviously, that one's going to be green on a day like today. That's not a 3x leverage like a SDAO is. SDAO is 3x leverage uh, against the market, essentially. SH is just 1x, okay? So there's no you know additional on top of that uh, when it comes to that one, okay? Now, the plan is up to here today. And look at good old Tesla. My ass somehow trying to eke out a, a green day to here today. That's typical Tesla. Tesla does. I always tell people this, okay, in the market. Tesla, 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 my Tesla does whatever the flip and flapjack Tesla wants to do, okay? This stock doesn't follow a trend. It doesn't do what the market wants it to do. It does whatever it wants to do. As somebody that's been in the stock for, I don't know, gosh, maybe five years now or so, I can just tell you, like, I've watched it before where the whole market went down substantially. And even I think back to, Kind of the fall of 2018, tons of other stocks were getting hit and Tesla was somehow going up. I seen it before where the market was going up and everything was going great and Tesla was going down. And it's like, oh my gosh, come on, Tesla. A good example of that is late last year, right? The market bottomed around October 13th and then started moving up in stocks. You know, there was countless stocks that started just, you know, going on a kind of a beast run there. And there, were, what was Tesla doing? Tesla kept going down and down and down. Tesla didn't bottom until basically the beginning of 2023. So Tesla does whatever the flip and flapjack Tesla wants to do, okay? That one runs its own race, does its own thing. It's got its own shareholder base, and it really doesn't follow the rules. So let's just put it that way, okay? If we look at the Dow 30 here today, 
There's definitely Red Dead Redemption out there. I sorted these in terms of weighting on how heavy the weights are for the Dow. So UNH is somewhat saving the Dow single-handedly today by being green here today. If this one was red, and, and honestly, a UNH play, that's probably just some people hiding money out there. That, that's the way some people look at something like United Health is like, I, I don't know what to do with my money. I'm going to hide it in UNH here today. So that baby is saving the Dow. If it wasn't for that, the Dow would have been down 500, 600, 700 points uh, today if that was one was Red Dead Redemption. But since it eked out a green, there you go. Okay. And you look at something like Stanley Black and Decker here today, down, uh, you know, 2 plus percent, 3 percent here today, right? 2.55 as I, I took this screenshot. This is another one of those that if you're talking about banking instability, it makes re recession concerns worse. This is a stock that's now down 45 percent in the past year. 45 percent. Is a lot of you know recessionary fears, and that's going to hit something like a Stanley Black and Decker in a major, major way, folks. Okay, now this is phenomenal, great news, phenomenal, great news. Okay, inflation as far as true inflation numbers, they have us under four percent right now for true inflation numbers. Okay, now this matters in such a huge, huge way, right? Because what has been the number one thing working against the market? It's been inflation. Right? It's been the fact that prices have been going insane. The Fed's had to work against the market. It's been a nightmare. It's been a, co a complete nightmare. And so the fact that you see true inflation numbers coming under a four number is huge. And like the government numbers will go to wherever true inflation numbers are over time here. Okay. And the interesting thing when you look at true inflation numbers, right, is remember, true inflation numbers could be, let's say, if they are somewhat inaccurate they could be actually inaccurate to the upside okay and if you think about it like this right the government numbers never had us at these sorts of numbers the government numbers had us max out at just over nine percent while true inflation had us at what it believed the real inflation number was at 11 or 12 percent so when you see true inflation coming at 3.8 don't be surprised if the government numbers over the next few months come under whatever true inflation's at because true inflation's already been to the upside. So this is something that's very important to factor in here, folks, okay? Very important. And a lot of people always believe that the government kind of cooks the numbers anyways, they say, right? That's always been the saying since I got in the market, right? And the government, you know, puts out whatever they want to put it out and changes. And I'm not going to get into that whole debate, but there's a thought process around that. So if you're thinking about that, then you could be saying maybe the government numbers will come in at a 3.2, 3.3, 3.5, something like that, um, you know, in a month or two, right? Because government numbers lag because they're always re releasing like a month, month and a half after the numbers are actually out, okay? So this is very intriguing. And now this matters in a significant way for how stocks are valued here, okay? And here's why. So with everything that's going on with First Republic, and also, if we're talking about commodities continue to tank here, if we have more of this problem, right, then Jerome Powell is not going to be able to raise at the next meeting. Now, there's about, uh, from what I've seen, around 80% of market participants are expecting the Fed to raise rates. That's as of this past week. The numbers could switch all around, okay? Around 80% were expecting the Fed to raise by just like 25 base points and then be done, okay, at this next meeting. But here's the deal. I already, I believe there's like, I believe there was like a 50-50 uh, on them even raising on this next meeting. If not, you know, like a 40-60, like they're more probable not to raise than raise, okay? But there was before this FRC situation got worse. as before more instability in the banking system. If you're talking about more instability in the banking system, that's going to put J-Pow in a situation where it's like, it's not even worth raising right now, okay? So, we know Wall Street is, is the kings of manipulation of whatever they want to manipulate for price, okay? So if they want j Powell not to raise anymore, and they say, you're done, mister, okay? Then what they'll do is they'll continue to kind of tank and cause massive volatility in the banking space. There's nothing more important than causing instability in those stocks. NVIDIA, Tesla, Meta, those stocks, they don't matter for the Fed making decisions. They don't care. Banking, whole different situation bank runs, bank stocks going down 40, 50% in a day, 10% in a day, 20% in a day. That's a whole, that's a whole different can of worms there. That's what the Fed looks at and says, oh boy, like we got real problems out here. We're creating real problems and we got to stop working against this market because there's massive instability in our financial system. In one of the Fed's jobs, right? The Fed has two main jobs. One is to keep prices in control. The other job is to keep unemployment low, right? The third kind of 
other job they have that is kind of not talked about as much is creating stability in the financial system. And if I'm telling you, if these stocks continue to tank and just be up and down and just insanity over this next, I would say, seven to 10 trading days, the Fed will be put in a situation where they won't raise. Because I say, you know, and so it's up to Wall Street, really. We know Wall Street could easily manipulate these stocks. You think FRC is just down 40% by accident today? You think they didn't already know these numbers that they were going to report? Come on now, okay? There, there's certain things going on and there's certain stocks moving certain ways because they want them to move that way, okay? The, the big Wall Street money. Because you know they can shake those up however they want to shake those babies up, right? So this is just something to kind of keep in mind there. And obviously, if the Fed doesn't raise, that's going to be, you know, the market's going to see that as a kind of a, a bullish thing in terms of that, right? And um, my my whole conspiracy theory, which if you follow my content religiously, you already know I speaking of, spoke about this conspiracy theory I have many times in the past. And my conspiracy theory is that this summer... Um, the market's going to force Jay Powell into actually cutting rates at some point this summer. That's been my conspiracy theory because I believe that inflation numbers are going to come down to the threes in the summertime. And I believe the market could create a dynamic in the short term where it caused a lot of instability in the market. And the Fed's put in a situation where they start having to cut rates because they're like, oh my gosh, we could be risking the whole system. And really, I don't know if it'll be that serious in terms of risking the system, but they could give the illusion by creating mass volatility in the market of like you're, you need to start cutting rates or we're going to end up falling off uh, the mountain here, okay? Falling off the mountain. So that's kind of my thought process in regards to that. We'll see what happens, but that's why that matters in a significant way, okay? Now, Whirlpool. I want to speak about Whirlpool here because I think this is actually an interesting opportunity, right? Stock's down huge in the past. You pull up a one year of Whirlpool, pull up an 18 month chart of Whirlpool, stock's down an epic amount, okay? It's a 5% dividend yield here. Uh, obviously low when it comes to the P metrics and it always kind of trades in a lower range, okay? Now, before we get into the numbers, which are actually awful for this company in the short term, okay? It's important to understand that my view on stocks, especially when it comes to good companies, is I want to start building positions before a company really rebounds. And I'm uh, might be a little known for catching falling knives, okay? And I don't mind catching falling knives. I get my hands bloodied many times, okay? And I'm bleeding all over the place. It is what it is. Like, I, I have no issue with that. I don't want to be in a situation where I'm the guy that was buying Whirlpool 18 months ago at, you know, near all-time highs and setting myself up for, a, obviously, a massive downside there, right? So Whirlpool is one of those stocks you have to kind of be in, getting into it when things are ugly, when the numbers are bad, you don't really want to be still in it or certainly buying it when everything looks great in the business. And it's like, oh, we just hit a quarterly record for our revenues all time. And because obviously a company like Whirlpool is very dependent upon how the economy is doing, how the housing market's doing. So it's going to have these major ups and downs, these ebbs and flows with their business model. Okay. And so the best time to buy a stock like Whirlpool is when things are ugly and things are pretty ugly in their business model. And I think they're going to continue to be ugly this entire year, which is why at some point in time here, I'm going to start a position in Whirlpool and then build into it as 2023 goes along. Okay. Now, when it comes to Whirlpool, they own many different brands. Okay. So you know, it's not like they only own the Whirlpool brand. You probably know them from the Whirlpool brand, but they own a ton of other brands, okay? Now, they're going to give you what their, you know, numbers were and things like that. I don't really care about this. I want to go more in-depth in this, okay? I want to pull up actually income statement, okay? Now, what we're going to find here, it's bad, okay? Revenue's down uh, almost $300 million year over year. Cost of, of, of goods sold, right, is $3.88 billion. So, it's down... That's good, right, in terms of uh, the cost of their product. But at the end of the day, it's not down as much as revenue is down. So that's very troubling, right? So that means their gross profit, gross margin here is $763 million versus $851 million in the same quarter last year. That's bad, okay? Selling general administrative expenses up over $100 million year over year. That's bad. Now, they have basically, uh, you know, a loss on some uh, on a business they sold, right? As far as that goes, um, I just kind of, you know, it's a, kind of looks like a one-off situation, so I don't really ding them for that. It is what it is, okay? So, but uh, that hurts their, their, if this was in parentheses, it would be a gain for the business, but since it's not, it's actually a loss for the business, okay? So, operating profit loss, only $43 million in operating profit versus 461. So, even if you, even if you take this out, you're at, I mean, what would that be? 265, $265 million operating profit if you take this out? Versus 461, that's still a horrible number, horrible number, okay? They have some interest expense things here, right? 
that are hurting them. So as far as earnings or loss before income ta taxes, they have $109 million loss actually, right? Versus a $427 million gain. Now, once again, if you take out that, they're still in the plus, but still, nonetheless, folks, like that's not good. That's not good at all, okay? Net earnings, negative 176 million versus positive 316 million in the same quarter uh, last year. Net earnings, obviously down substantially. As far as EPS, uh, net earnings of EPS, right? 327 negative versus 537 positive in the same quarter last year. And they declared still $1.75 of dividends, which is not ideal to be declaring that big of dividends when you're taking a massive loss. When you're making $5 plus in EPS and you pay $1.75, who cares? Like, that's nothing, okay? There's no problem. But when you lose $3 plus and you're paying out $1.75 dividends per share, that's, that's not an ideal situation, okay? So income statement's a complete disaster for Whirlpool. Now they're restructuring a bunch of their business right now, making some big changes, one-time expenses. Like, obviously all that's going on into a weaker environment for big ticket purchases, which Whirlpool would fall into that category. So naturally it's kind of makes sense why they're, they're, they're ugly here, okay? Balance sheet wise, this is just on a quarter over quarter basis. Total current assets down, you know, about $300 million roughly there. So that's not good. As far as total assets down, we're down about $300 million roughly as far as total assets, right? Total current liabilities is actually up slightly. And as far as um, uh, total non-current liabilities, we're, you know, roughly in, in line there, okay? So which means stockholder equity is going to be down just a, a slight amount there, which is not uh, ideal situation, okay? So when I look at something like a Whirlpool, they're in a messy situation right now on several different fronts, right? But I believe that as this year ticks on, it's going to become less messy, and um, I think they'll get in a better position. In terms of housing, uh, new home builds actually is staying relatively strong, which is very surprising. And it's because a lot of people don't want to sell their homes because they locked in at insanely low mortgage rates. A lot of people either bought homes or refinanced in 2020 and 2021 at 2.8%, 3%. 3.3%. So you're not having a lot of people that even want to move right now because they're locked in at some super low mortgage rate. And so why would you want to move and, and sell, get rid of your 2.8% mortgage to then go ahead and get a new mortgage on a new house at 6%, 6.5%. 6 why would you do that at 7%? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make financial sense whatsoever right now, right? Never mind, you know, properties are obviously much more expensive than if you brought, bought properties, let's call it prior to 2022, right? So for the home builders, it, the market's actually staying decent for them. Despite a weaker economy, super high mortgage rates, only because they had huge backlogs and because no one's selling their flip and flapjack in houses. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, inventory's gone up. But if you look at inventory, actually in a lot of markets versus the past, it hasn't gone up that much, right? And when it comes to Whirlpool, there's always going to be a replacement cycle because sooner or later, people's dishwashers and, and refrigerators and ovens and all that stuff breaks, right? So it's an interesting time period uh, for Whirlpool. Obviously bad in terms of their business, but I think things will get better as the year ticks on. And so that's why I'm looking to likely build a position in that one sooner rather than later in regards to this, right? Obviously earnings craziness coming here, folks. It's going to be wild. So get ready for all that. This next few days is going to be absolute insanity. I'll keep you up to date, obviously, on this channel and my reaction channel as well. I appreciate everybody joining me as always. Uh, Patreon squad, if you're looking to join my Patreon and see all the moves I'm making in the market, make sure you join ASAP in there. The $10 tier is going to be going bye-bye for anybody that's not grandfathered here very soon. And uh, then all we'll have is a $19 tier with the Discord chat after that, okay? And so that's going to be going away very soon. So if you want to get in grandfather for the $10 tier, join like literally today. Um, that will be pinned comment down there. Much love and have a great day.